Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so appreciative to all of you for joining us today for this important conversation um, about poverty and income supports in the United States. Um, my name is Alex Gilworth, and I lead the Washington Center for Equitable Growth's work on family economic security. Let me tell you a little bit about us. Um, the Washington Center for Equitable Growth is a nonprofit research and grant making organization dedicated to advancing evidence backed ideas that promote strong, stable, and broadly shared economic growth. Founded in 2013, our mission is to bridge the gap between leading thinkers at universities around the country and policymakers right here in Washington, D.C., and in the States. Our research and analysis focuses on policies that improve workers and families' economic stability, well-being, and mobility, and also looks into how to address structural inequality and the racial and gender inequities that are woven into the U.S. economy. Equitable Growth has funded more than 250 researchers up and down the career ladder through our annual peer-reviewed competitive grant-making process. Our grantees investigate the consequences of economic inequality and the key channels through which inequality may affect growth and stability. So income support is an issue that is fundamentally connected to structural inequality in our economy and connected to our nation's capacity for economic growth. So I'm truly delighted that you have joined us for today's event, which is the next installment of Equitable, Equitable Growth Presents, a lecture series that seeks to foster a deeper understanding of cutting edge research and analysis on economic inequality and growth. Our lectures bring together leading scholars to explore how new research is shifting important conversations in, acad in academia and in economic policy. So today we'll be hearing from Mark Rank, who is the Herbert S. Hadley Professor of Social Welfare at Washington University in St. Louis, where he studies issues of poverty, inequality, and social justice in the United States. His latest book with co-authors Heather Bullock, a psychology professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Lawrence Eppard, a sociologist at Shippensburg University, is titled Poorly Understood, What America Gets Wrong About Poverty. Today, Dr. Rink will present research about on the prevalence of poverty, its structural origins, and how and why poverty is so misunderstood in the United States. We'll also hear from Alexandra Cawthorn Gaines, the Vice President of the Poverty to Prosperity Program at the Center for American Progress. Gaines has an impressive career distinguished by service to organizations that advocate on behalf of children and families with low incomes. So Mark's presentation will be followed by remarks from Alex on how, to, how understanding these myths of poverty can inform current policy debates on how to strengthen and expand our income support system to invest in people and also to grow the economy. So before we dive in, I just want to offer a few housekeeping notes for everyone. So you all can't see each other right now, but I want to let you know that everyone in our audience is bringing this, this wealth of knowledge and a real diversity of perspectives to the topics at hand. So it's my sincere hope that you all will participate throughout the event. We have a ton to learn from each other. So, so to that end, uh, you can share observations and thoughts with your fellow attendees using the chat function. And we'll also be compiling attendee questions for our presenters throughout the event. So anytime a question pops into your mind for our fabulous presenters, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. In that Q&A box, when you're asking your questions, please give your first and last name along with your organizational affiliation if you have one. And if you encounter any technical questions or difficulties, uh, you can feel free to send a direct message to the EG Events account in the chat. Finally, um, please note that this lecture is being recorded and is on the record. So you can feel free to tweet away and use the hashtag uh, EG Presents in your posts. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and I'll also note for all of you that he's presenting without slides today. So don't worry that you're missing anything. Just pay attention to um, his smart words that he is offering to us. Thank, thank you and take it away, Mark. All right, thanks, Alex. Thanks so much for that introduction. And uh, I'd like to also welcome everyone uh, as well uh, to, this, to this talk and, and uh, discussion. So what I'd like to do is to focus on several aspects of my um, research that I think dovetails really well with the mission of the center, which is to promote broad-based economic growth that benefits everyone. Uh, much of my research has focused on the issue of understanding poverty in the United States. And poverty is certainly a sign uh, 
that economic growth is not evenly shared across the population. We might think of it as the canary in the coal mine. As more people experience poverty, it's a warning sign that fewer Americans are sharing in the benefits of growth. And as I'll argue, it also serves as a drag on overall economic growth. So my recent book, which Alex mentioned uh, with co-authors Lawrence Eppard and Heather Bullock, pulls together much of my research on poverty and inequality in the US. And what I'd like to do in the 20 or 25 minutes here is to focus on three aspects or three questions that, that, have, uh, that have centered around this research. First off, what do we know about the life course risk of poverty in the United States and how has that changed over time? Second, what is the actual economic cost of poverty to the United States as a whole? And third, how might we better understand why poverty occurs in the United States and what we can do to effectively reduce it? So let me start off uh, with discussing my life course research into the risk of poverty. This line of, of work began with a very simple question. And that question was, what is the likelihood that Americans at some point in their lives would experience poverty? Now, as I began thinking about this question a number of years ago, we knew very little about what that risk was. Uh, we certainly had information about how many people are poor in any given year, and we knew how long and how often people experience poverty, but we really knew very little about the long-term risk of poverty. By using a longitudinal data set that many of you are familiar with, the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, uh, which has followed a nationally representative sample of households every year since 1968, my colleague Tom Herschel at Cornell and I have been able to shed some light on this question. And it turns out that the number of Americans who are touched by poverty during their lifetimes is quite high. And we've looked at this a number of different ways, and the results are all pretty much the same. For example, between the ages of 20 and 75, it turns out that nearly 60% of Americans will experience at least one year below the official poverty line, and three quarters will experience either poverty or near poverty. We've also looked at the likelihood of poverty using a relative measure, that is, what percentage of Americans will find themselves in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, as well as the bottom 10% of the income distribution. And what we find is that between the ages of 25 and 60, 62% of Americans will experience at least one year in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, and 42% of Americans will experience a year in the bottom 10% of the income distribution. If we focus on the use of a welfare or safety net program, we also find very high percentages. So for example, in one analysis that we did, we looked at what percentage of children would be in a household that used the SNAP or food stamp program at some point during their childhood. And that percentage turned out to be 49%. And if we look at poverty from the broader perspective of significant economic insecurity, then we find an even higher rate of incidence than these numbers. So in an earlier book called Chasing the American Dream, we constructed a measure of economic insecurity that included whether you were using a welfare program, uh, falling below 150% of the poverty line, or having the head of household unemployed at some point during the year. So did one of these three events happen to you at some point during the year? And when using this combined measure, we found that four out of five Americans will experience at least one year of significant economic insecurity between the ages of 25 and 60. And half of the population will experience three or more years of economic insecurity. Finally, in another analysis, we found that the life course risk of poverty has been rising from the 1970s onward. In other words, the chances of experiencing poverty at some point in your life has been rising, even though the annual rates of poverty have remained roughly the same. 
Now, the question that I'm often asked regarding these percentages is why are they so high? And the reason that they're so high is that during the course of a lifetime, any number of things can happen to people, many of which are unexpected and detrimental. So losing a job, a family splitting up, getting sick, experiencing a pandemic. When these events happen, there's often little to protect families from falling into poverty. More and more families, including middle income families, are experiencing greater volatility and downward swings in their income as a result of greater instability in the labor market and the lack of benefits such as health and unemployment insurance. So jobs are no longer as stable as they once were. Retirement benefits are harder to get. Good medical coverage may be difficult to obtain. The safety net has weakened over time and so on. So rather than a risk that affects a few on the fringes of society, it turns out that poverty and the use of welfare are events that actually strike the vast majority of American citizens. And this is a fundamentally different understanding of the issue. And it's one that implies we all have a direct self-interest in addressing the issue of poverty. And it also implies that a large segment of the population have not been experiencing the benefits of economic growth. Okay, a second question that I wanna talk about here that I've been interested in is the question of what is the economic cost of poverty to the country as a whole? And this gets at the issue of why addressing poverty is so important. It also sheds light on the extent to which poverty results in a drag on overall economic growth. Now, there have been a couple of research studies that looked into this question, but there was a real need to, uh, to do a more recent analysis of this. And so what I and a graduate student here at Washington University did was to focus on the question of estimating the annual cost of childhood poverty in the United States. And what we did is we used the latest research to estimate the cost of poverty in several different areas. So these included the effect that childhood poverty has on lowering future economic productivity, the effect of childhood poverty on increasing healthcare costs, and the effect of childhood poverty upon raising criminal justice costs. We know that poverty in childhood results in less economic productivity when children become adults. It results in higher healthcare costs and it raises the costs associated with increased crime and incarceration. We were uh, conservative in measuring these costs and there were also many other potential costs of poverty that we didn't include in the analysis simply because of a lack of data. So we might think of our estimate as a lower bound in terms of the economic price of childhood poverty. Well, when we sum together these costs, the overall estimate was that in 2015, childhood poverty in the United States was costing the nation slightly over $1 trillion a year. To put this in perspective, that was approximately 28% of the entire federal budget in 2015. The other calculation that we made was a cost benefit analysis of reducing poverty. So our estimate was that for every dollar we spend on reducing childhood poverty, we would save between seven and $12 in the future by reducing the economic and social costs of poverty. As a result, we argue that reducing childhood poverty is not only the morally right thing to do, but it's also economically the smart thing to do as well. The bottom line is that the price of poverty is exceedingly high. And by allowing poverty to exist at such high levels, we wind up spending considerably more in many areas than if poverty were substantially reduced. So impoverishment breeds serious health problems, inadequately educated children, and higher rates of criminal activity. As a result, we pay more for health care, we produce less productive workers, and we divert needed resources into building and maintaining of correctional facilities. In each of these cases, we're spending our money on the back end of the problem of poverty rather than the front end, 
which is always a more expensive approach to take. You know, the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is certainly apropos in this situation. So it's not a question of paying or not paying, Rather, it's a question of how we want to pay, which then affects the amount we end up spending. By underinvesting in a segment of the population, the economy loses some of its potential human capital. On the other hand, social policies that invest in education, health, and skill development are rewarded with a more dynamic and innovative workforce. This, in turn, helps to create greater economic growth and productivity for the society as a whole. And I would assume that most of us prefer to spend our money in a smart and efficient way. And that's precisely what we're advocating for in targeting poverty as a high priority issue. So by making an investment um, upfront to alleviate poverty, the evidence strongly suggests that we will be repaid many times over in the lower costs associated with a host of social problems, as well as having a more robust economy. So that's the second piece of evidence that I, or piece of research that I wanted to talk about um, that I think is important in terms of thinking about the goals of the center here. And the third question that I wanna uh, talk about uh, for a few minutes is the question of why does the United States have such high rates of poverty? Much of my work has focused on this particular question. And one of the main points that I make is that American poverty is largely the result of a failure at the structural level rather than the individual level. Um, there simply are not enough viable opportunities for all Americans. And this is really in contrast to the typical way that we've thought about poverty in the United States, that is, that it's the result of individual failings, such as not working hard enough or not having enough adequate skills or education. What I argue is that individual deficiencies, such as the lack of education or skills, helps to explain who's more likely to be left out in the competition to locate and secure such opportunities. But it can explain why there's a shortage of opportunities in the first place. In order to answer that question, we must turn to the inability of the economic and political structures to provide the supports and opportunities necessary to lift all Americans out of poverty. And the most ex obvious example of this is the mismatch between the number of decent paying jobs versus the pool of labor in search of such jobs. So over the past 50 years, the US economy has been producing more and more low wage paying jobs and jobs that are lacking in benefits. So it's estimated that in the United States today, approximately 40% of all jobs are considered low paying. That is defined as less than $16 an hour. And of course, beyond these low paying jobs, there are millions of Americans that are unemployed at any point in time and millions that are working part-time but wanna be working full-time. So there's a mismatch between those in need of decent paying jobs and the availability of such jobs. Now exacerbating this situation is the fact that the American social safety net is extremely weak, resulting in sizable numbers of families falling through its rather large holes. The US has also failed to offer the kinds of universal coverage for childcare, medical coverage, and affordable housing that most other developed countries routinely provide. And the result of all this is an increasing number of families at risk of economic vulnerability and poverty. And the way that I like to illustrate this is with the analogy of musical chairs. So what I say is picture a game of musical chairs in which there are 10 players, but only eight chairs available at any point in time. Now, those who are likely to lose out at this game will tend to have characteristics that put them at a disadvantage in terms of competing for those available chairs. They're not as agile, not as quick. Maybe they were in a bad position when the music stopped. However, 
given that the game is structured in a way such that two players are bound to lose, then these individual characteristics only explain who in particular loses out, not why there are losers in the first place. And the critical mistake that we've made in the past is we've equated the question of who loses out at the game with the question of why the game produces losers in the first place. They are in fact distinct and separate questions. So while characteristics such as deficiencies in skills and education or being in a single parent family help to explain who in the population is at a heightened risk of encountering poverty, the fact that poverty exists in the first place results not from these characteristics, but rather from a failure of the economic and political structures to provide enough decent opportunities and supports in society. By focusing solely upon individual characteristics such as education, we can shuffle people up and down in terms of their, their being more likely to land a job with good earnings, but we're still gonna have somebody lose out if there aren't enough decent jobs to go around. In short, we're playing a large scale version of musical chairs in which there are many more players than there are chairs available. And the recognition of this dynamic, I think really represents a fundamental shift from our old ways of thinking. It helps to explain why the social policies of the past have largely been ineffective in reducing the rates of poverty. We focused our attention and our resources on either altering the incentives and disincentives for those who are playing the game, or in a very limited way, upgrading their skills and ability to compete in the game, while at the same time, we've left the structure of the game untouched. Now, when the overall rates of poverty do go up or down, they do so primarily as a result of changes at the structural level that increase or decrease the number of available chairs. So in particular, the performance of the economy has been historically important. Why? Because when the economy is expanding, more opportunities or chairs are available for the competing pool of labor and their families. The reverse occurs when the economy slows down and contracts. Consequently, during the 1930s or after the Great Recession of 2008 or during the recent pandemic when the economy has been doing badly, poverty rates have gone up. And while during periods of economic prosperity, such as the 1960s or the middle to later uh, 1990s, the overall rates of poverty declined. Likewise, changes in various social supports and the social safety net will make a difference in terms of how well families are able to avoid poverty or near poverty. So when such supports were increased through the war on poverty initiatives in the 1960s, poverty rates declined. Likewise, when social security benefits were expanded during the 1960s and 1970s, the elderly's poverty rates sharply declined. Conversely, when social supports have been weakened and eroded, as in the case of children's programs over the last 30 years, their rates of poverty have gone up. The recognition of poverty as a structural failing also makes it quite clear why the United States has such high rates of poverty compared to other Western countries. These rates have nothing to do with Americans being less motivated or less skilled than those in other countries, but with the fact that our economy has been producing millions of low wage jobs in the face of global competition, and that our social policies have done relatively little to support families compared to our European neighbors. And this has been sh shown repeatedly in various analyses that have used the Luxembourg Income Study. So from this perspective, one of the keys to addressing poverty is to increase the labor market opportunities and the social supports available to American households. To summarize, a, a shift in thinking about the causes of poverty from an individually based explanation to a structurally based explanation allows us to distinguish and make sense of two specific questions. First, why does poverty exist? And second, who is more likely to experience poverty? 
The musical chairs analogy handles both of those questions. So poverty exists primarily as a result of a shortage of viable economic opportunities and supports for the entire population. Given this shortage, a certain percentage of the population is insured of experiencing poverty. Individuals with a heightened risk of being on the short end of this economic stick will be those who are less able to effectively compete for the limited number of decent economic opportunities. This includes those with fewer marketable skills, less education, ill health, single parents, and so on. This approach recognizes, therefore, the fundamental distinction between understanding who loses out at the game versus understanding how and why the game produces losers in the first place. So given this analysis, what might some of the solutions be towards reducing poverty? Or to use the musical chairs analogy, how might we provide more chairs for those who are playing the game? And I'm sure that Alex will discuss some of these in her comments, but let me uh, begin this discussion by just mentioning a few of those. First of all, we need policies that will increase the number of jobs that pay a livable wage that can support a family. Um, these policies would include raising the minimum wage to a livable wage, expanding the earned income tax credit, uh, and creating more jobs through large scale initiatives such as the Biden administration's infrastructure program or perhaps a Green New Deal. Second, we need policies and programs that protect individuals and families from falling into poverty. So the safety net needs to be strengthened and currently discuss policy ideas such as child, uh, a child allowance and a universal basic income should certainly be considered as well. In addition, we need to move towards providing universal coverage to things like health care, quality child care, and affordable housing. The United States is just about the only OECD country that doesn't provide access to these uh, vital resources. And third, we should promote policies that invest in the building of assets of lower income households, just as we do for middle and upper income households. There's a variety of innovative policies that have been at play at the state level and could be ramped up to the national level as well. All of these ideas and policies focus on addressing the structural failings that result in the United States having the highest rates of poverty and inequality among the high economy countries. And as we argue in the book, in some ways, finding the solutions to poverty is a lot easier than finding the political will to engage in these policies. However, given the initiatives put forth by the Biden administration, I'm actually guardedly optimistic that we may be entering a window of time where we might actually be able to accomplish some significant changes to address poverty and inequality. And so with that, I will end my comments and we'll turn it over to Alex for her comments and discussion. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate that presentation and, and lots of fabulous uh, data to dig a bit more into. But first, I wanna underscore the importance of Mark's research on the pervasiveness of poverty. It is more widespread than understood. It's also not a static situation or life event for most people. He found that nearly 60% of Americans, which is most Americans, will experience at least one year living at or below the poverty level between the age of 20 and 75. Other research I've seen supports this and highlights the pervasiveness of poverty, particularly in our prime working years. Mark has called this a normative event, and indeed it is. And for many people, the threat of poverty looms large. I think the last year provides a perfect illustration of that point. The impacts of the coronavirus pandemic and related economic fallout have been widespread. Joblessness remains fairly high, and millions of households have reported that they are facing hunger and the threat of eviction as they are unable to, meet, to make ends meet. Uh, CAP's poverty team recently conducted a poll in collaboration with GBAO Strategies to better understand what American voters think about various solutions for improving the U.S. economy and fighting poverty. Some of the questions that we sought to address included, how are workers and their families doing financially during the pandemic? Do voters favor substantial government interventions to address unemployment, low wages, and high household costs? Or are they skeptical of these actions? And what are voters' main priorities for action? 
this poll went out to a representative sample of roughly 2,000 voters nationwide. We found that more than 40% of voters experienced some acute economic hardship in the past year. Roughly one quarter of American voters say that their personal economic situation is worse now than it was before the pandemic, with more than one third reporting that their family's income is failing to keep up with the cost of living. Given ongoing employment and income issues throughout the past year of lockdowns and restrictions due to COVID-19, our study finds that many Americans, particularly women and younger people, are facing acute economic problems. Again, lots of people are hurting, but we found that specifically younger voters and voters of color are struggling the most in this survey. Uh, voters first facing the most challenges now in the context of the pandemic, again, being voters of color and specifically Gen Z and millennial voters, many of whom are now parents, who've reported having a much harder time securing good jobs and keeping up with bills and necessities. Also, women voters in the survey were more likely than men to say their personal economic situation is worse than since the pandemic, as were voters earning less than $50,000 annually. So given that living in or near poverty is so pervasive across generations, across race and ethnic lines, political lines, and so on, the question really remains as to why there is such a disconnect between the economic insecurity people are experiencing in their own lives and what they believe to be true about poverty. There are several reasons why this is the case. These include bigger picture things like racism, sexism, and ableism. But I'm actually going to focus a bit more on how racism influence, influences perception and policy approaches to poverty. While survey data supports the notion that Americans generally believe that opportunities should not be hindered by race, ethnicity, gender, where you're born, other factors that are largely out of your control, it shows a continued skepticism about the existence of racial discrimination in particular. And just as importantly, there are deep-seated racial stereotypes about people living in poverty that persist. Those stereotypes and racial bias warp perceptions of poor people and they undermine support for tangible solutions to poverty even when those policy solutions are actually in the best interests of the majority of us. And there is significant research highlighting how anti-Black racism in particular has driven this country's approach to anti-poverty policy going back even further than the trope of the welfare queen to the time of Jim Crow and this country's separate but equal doctrine that essentially resulted in the development of a two-track service delivery system, both in law and in custom one for whites and one for blacks, that, some research, that one researcher described as anything but equal. This continues to play into our mental models of who lives in poverty and for what reasons, and the extent to which we believe that the government should play a role in addressing poverty. Mark's book importantly calls out how politicians across the political aisle specifically benefit from myths and stereotype and policymaking, using these things to score political points. And it's important to acknowledge and break this down so that people can regain focus on the systemic issues that Mark has talked about that are perpetuating poverty and bad outcomes for many of us, resulting from longstanding income inequality. Research from the Opportunity Agenda highlights the importance of talking about race explicitly and strategically with a lens of shared values, meaning that it's important for those of us advocating for anti-poverty policy solutions to talk about how achieving racial equity and proactively addressing the unequal barriers to economic mobility that people of color face benefits our entire society. Our polling data really supports that notion. The CAP study employed a, sp a split sample experiment to assess the same presentation of CDC data about disproportionate impacts, both through the lens of race and ethnicity and through a poverty lens. So while half of the sample received a question about the disproportionate impacts of the coronavirus on those living in poverty, the other half received a question about the disproportionate impacts on Black Americans and Hispanics specifically. We found that the framing influenced voters' appetite for big, bold changes versus a return to the status quo. So when framing the impacts of the recession with a focus on economic inequality, voters were more likely to say that we should make big changes that address historical inequities. We conclude from this not that we shouldn't talk about race, but that we must talk about race and poverty together, highlighting the inextricable link and the ways in which addressing inequality will actually benefit us all. Um, I'm going to shift uh, very quickly. I'm going to shift gears very quickly and offer some comments connected to Mark's research on the cost of childhood poverty that show that poverty in, uh, in childhood costs the U.S. slightly more than one trillion annually. This research is foundational for a broader moment in which we're that we're in, in which there's momentum behind the idea that child poverty is a solvable problem and that it demands significant investment. I really appreciate how Mark talks about addressing childhood poverty as paying for the front end of the problem, as opposed to paying for higher social and economic costs that result from a failure to invest in policies that put children on good footing for long-term success as adults. Almost a third of all people living in poverty in this country are children. This is unconscionable in such a wealthy society. 
uh, there's been this longstanding policy conversation focused on education as the great equalizer. Uh, we saw that when the pandemic forced schools to shift to distance and virtual learning, it worsened the barriers to quality education for low-income children that already existed and pushed their parents, particularly mothers, to choose between caregiving, staying at home, and employment. My colleague Ariba Hader authored a paper on child poverty that makes the point that without serious interventions, an economic recovery will leave low income and marginalized people and their children behind. And already some analysis is finding that just that the child poverty rate has ticked up dramatically since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. So returning very briefly to CAPS polling data, we tested support for a suite of policy interventions that could address the unequal outcomes and found strong support for the role of government and ensuring access to quality public education as a basic human right, along with things like access to clean water, nutritious food, quality affordable housing. We've seen the successful package of stimulus bills into law that include bold investment in basic needs, including infrastructure, affordable housing, nutrition programs, and education among others. But I think the most exciting development that Mark talks about in his research is the emergence of support in this country for a child allowance. CAPS poll did not explicitly test for support for a child allowance, uh, but it did test support for the expanded child tax credit, which has proven to be a popular and important policy for poverty allevi alleviation, especially for children and families in deep poverty. The American Rescue Plan made millions of children and their families that are living in or near poverty eligible for a benefit that was originally intended to help families manage the additional costs of raising children. And now there's this growing contingency of policymakers at the federal level calling for the permanent expansion of the child tax credit. Groups like CAP, the Children's Defense Fund, and many others are thinking through different ways to administer this benefit, including the potential of transitioning it from a tax benefit to a cash transfer program that could potentially could be administered through the Social Security Administration. So it, lo it would look much more like the benefit that Mark mentioned uh, that exists in Europe and other places. Uh, the last point I want to make very quickly is responding to Mark's discussion of poverty as a failure at the structural and political levels. This is so important. I want to briefly return to this multi-year polling data from CAP. The years of work that researchers, advocates, and other stakeholders have done to influence public understanding and shift this awareness of poverty as a policy choice has really paid off. In our recent poll, we saw strong majorities of voters across political lines rejecting the myth that poverty is caused by bad decisions and that there are things that we can and that we should do to address it, including many of the, of the policy ideas that Mark raised, in, including raising, raising the minimum wage, providing universal health care coverage, as well as universal child care. I'll stop there and allow for questions. Well, those were great, great comments. Um, I'll just I'll just add one thing to Alex. What you were saying, um, you know, you raised uh, just uh, really good points. Um, but um, let me just uh, mention about the issue of race and poverty because I think that that's so important. Um, and you know what happens is, uh, and I have this quote from, from President Johnson that I think is a very, very telling quote, um, but race has been used over and over to divide poor whites and poor blacks from seeing their common interest. Um, and so this was a quote from, that we have in the book from Lyndon Johnson where he was talking to an aide in 1960. And he says, um, I'll tell you what's at the bottom of it. If you can convince the lowest white man that he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. And that's what we've seen over and over and over again. And so I think your point about, you know, we need to think about these issues in a broad sense, still recognizing that there's clearly a racial dimension to poverty, but it's also a wider issue than just folks of color. Right. Um Thank you, Alex, for those comments. And Mark, um, thank you for kind of that response. Um, before I move on to the questions that were submitted in the Q&A box, did you have anything else you wanted to add um, in response to Alex, Mark? No, she said it all. <laughs> you did. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, so we have um, gotten some really great questions in the Q&A box. And um, 
I can see that um, questions about race, structural racism and interpersonal racism are really on the forefront of people's minds, um, which makes sense at all times, but also particularly today in light of the verdict um, that was issued last night. Um, so I wanna kind of start off by building on the conversation that Alex and Mark are already having about this. Um, so uh, I'll stack two questions together. Um, one is from Shira Markov at Prosperity Now. Um, and potentially this has been addressed, but I want to give you the opportunity to kind of um, return to it. So Shira asks, Mark discussed how structural factors affect poverty. However, he did not mention structural racism, which has now been uh, talked about, um, but what role does racism play into the fact that there aren't enough chairs for everyone? Um, and then I wanted to uh, take moderator's privilege and, and layer on a question for myself as well, um, which is perhaps a provocative question, right? So, so we know that racism and poverty um, policy are very intertwined in the United States. And so I'm just wondering, is it really a fool's errand to try and address these economic inequality questions in the US when racism is everywhere in our public discourse and economic institutions? Um, so I'll start with you, Mark, and then um, Alex, if you wanna chime in as well, please do. Yeah, well, I think it, the, the, a good way of thinking about it is that um, structural racism is, uh, is clearly an important factor in terms of thinking about the musical chairs analogy and how many chairs are available. And so that's certainly, you know, when we think about uh, economic structural things, uh, political structural things, obviously race, discrimination plays a, a key role. The other thing I'll just throw out in terms of this to, to sort of illustrate the impact that race has on our sort of our approach to the social safety net. There's been a lot of research to show that in societies that are more racially homogeneous, they tend to have a much more generous social safety net. So if you think about the Nordic countries or these kinds of countries, whereas countries that are much more heterogeneous in terms of race and ethnicity, they tend to be much less generous in terms of their safety net programs. And the argument is that we feel more of a connection to people who look like us. If they look different than us, we, we have less of a, we feel less of a connection, less need to, to help others. And I think that that's very, very telling. I think that's right. I think the only thing I will add is that um, to sort of address the, the second question that was layered on um, is that it's certainly not a fool's errand, I think, to uh, clearly tackle head on both race, uh, race, racial inequality and poverty um, in the context of the policies that we're pursuing. Uh, but I think the framing is what matters. That's sort of what I was trying to get at. Uh, so, so I think what's helpful for the case is to really present data on racial disparities or inequalities through this contribution model instead of just a deficit model, right? Uh, so for example, when you're talking about uh, unequal outcomes, we should really talk about or make every effort to focus on how closing gaps will really benefit society as a whole. Uh, and you could do that sort of looking at, for example, closing the uh, graduation gap, right? Uh, among or between uh, white and black students or uh, black and Latinx students or et cetera. Um, but focusing on why this is the smart thing to do as well as the right thing to do, um, I think is so critically important. And I would just add to that, um, that, you know, one of the main points here is that it's so foolish for us not to be investing in our people. It's so foolish for us to write off a segment of the population. I mean, this is what the Center for Equitable Growth is about, is about, you know, having growth that benefits us all. But, but the other thing is that growth is affected by our investments in people. And so, you know, it just, it, and that's why I say, not only is this morally the right thing to do to address poverty and these issues, but it's also economically the smart thing to do. Great. And um, I am getting some like uh, great action in the Q&A box uh, related to this. So I wanna keep on kind of building on this thread. And um, I also wanna encourage folks uh, keep on chiming in with your questions and we'll try to get them integrated. So um, Liz Hippel from the Joint Economic Committee um, just kind of chimed in as you were talking. She says, I'm curious to learn more from Alexandra about how we can build support for better safety net programs given that systemic racism has so influenced both their design as well as their public support. So I hear Liz saying like, 
yes, you're right. I see how we are being constrained. Um, how can we address that constraint? That's the million dollar question, I think. You know, uh, several conversations I engage in on a regular basis, I think within my organization and outside with partners are around this notion of incrementalism versus like blowing a system up, right? And starting over. There are people who believe, for example, that, that TANA for, you know, temporary assistance for needy families or welfare is so inherently racist in its structure and design that it's not worth uh, continuing to figure out how to fix the program, to tweak around the edges of it. Um, and so in lieu of that, should we be thinking about a different entirely uh, system for cash transfer, right? And, and that's where the conversation around universal uh, basic income or guaranteed income sort of comes into play. And a lot of the really uh, exciting results we're seeing from experiments at the local level, uh, you know, particularly focused on, on mothers of color. Um, so, so, you know, I don't have a, an easy or direct answer to that one. I, I think that we certainly can't throw out all of the systems and programs as they currently exist, that we should be fighting to improve them. And I think that Mark's research uh, builds a very big point that these are things that everyone needs. And in fact, during the, uh, the economic downturn over the last year, we've seen a situation, especially when you look at the unemployment insurance system, for example, right, where people have not been able to access it quickly enough, where people even to this day are missing critical benefits, where we're, you know, on the edge of this significant eviction crisis because people are thousands of dollars behind in their rent. And so there's a clear case for the, um, there's a clear evidence for the case that we actually need these programs, we need these systems, we need them to work together, we need better alignment. We also need to collect data, I saw a question I think around that, uh, that, that shows how these programs are working and who they're working for and who they're not working for. Um, so so I, you know, I always try to sort of push for both doing these critical fixes and, and highlighting states and local governments and actors who were, who were doing great work to do that as an example to other uh, other states is what they could be doing to improve their systems and the delivery of their services, while also really capturing the lessons learned from this local experimentation when it comes to things like guaranteed income to sort of to sort of inform what a national approach to a new cash transfer system could look like. Yeah, and I would just say, um, you know, maybe maybe one of the silver linings of this pandemic that we've gone through is that it, it it illustrates these things. It illustrates this structural failing, and that we really need to address these problems. And and so that's the you know, and that's where I again I said at the end of my comments that I think we are we do have a window open at this point to really do some very very innovative and progressive things. So I'm I'm quite hopeful the next year may look really good. I love like how, how I said this to you before, Mark, but like how rare is it to be, like, <laughs> you know, doing the work that we do and, no. and looking at these issues and have a moment of hope. So true pleasure to be here with both of you today, <laughs> this uh, kind of political moment. And um, I hope to kind of turn back to those some of those policy questions, but I did want to pull on that thread that Alex had um, started that's taking us back to the research. Um, so we have a question from Mark Gomez at the Leap Forward Project, and he says, in an age of big data, he's interested in, in your thoughts on data innovation that will allow us to better understand who is poor, why they're poor, and what to do about it, um, especially following people on time, uh, over time. So kind of you know, we're, there's there's uh, windows that are open to us beyond um, our kind of uh, typical survey data sets and um, what can they do from us? What are their limitations? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the big innovation in terms of my work has been, you know, the long, large longitudinal studies, which have followed people over time. And that's really the only way you can address some of these issues. But there's some great examples out there of big data. Um, one that just immediately comes to mind is the, the work of Raj Chetty, um, who has this opportunity atlas on the uh, as a website and you can go there and you can see like, you know, what effect does it does, um, you know, living in a particular neighborhood have on life outcomes and and how, what effect does parental income and, and all of these things have and uh, that that's just a great example of showing you know, really some of these structural things and then thinking about what can we do to address those. So, um, so yeah, I mean, this is, again, this is kind of an exciting uh, time that we're in and that we have different uh, uh, data and, and, and things available to us that weren't available, you know, even 10 years ago. I think the only thing I would add is that um, I do think it's important to also acknowledge the um, 
benefit and the sort of uh, texture and additional perspective you get to research when you uh, provide an opportunity for some quality, qualitative data. Yeah. And so um, prior to my time at CAP, I spent several years in the National Governors Association, and there were mm. um, a number of states that were increasingly employing human-centered design and their policy work. And, you know, that would look something as simple as bringing parents who were uh, participating in a workforce development program and to sort of talk about their experiences, you know, the challenges they're having in navigating the system, how their children are doing, all of that kind of good stuff. Uh, and it was heartening to see how uh, policymakers were really thinking through and administrators of these programs were thinking through how to uh, respond to what they were hearing and really put people's experiences at the center of their policy design. Yeah, and I would just say I'm, I'm just a huge advocate of kind of mixed methods because I think, you know, it's important to have the numbers and the statistics, but it's so important to know what's the meaning behind those numbers and statistics. What's the human meaning behind these things? And that's where qualitative data is just so great to bring that out. Um, you guys are really speaking my language here. Um, I am also a large fan of mixed methods. Um, I Yeah. So I want to um, turn to just kind of, um, I don't know if it's a technical or descriptive question, but um, this comes from Charlie Simmons at Patriotic Millionaires. Uh, and he asks, uh, what percentage of poverty is due to medical bills? So I think just understanding um, medical debt, medical bills, but um, also other kinds of, of debts that people might carry would be probably interesting. So I don't ha have an exact um uh, figure for that. I know that that's an important factor in throwing people into poverty. And there's the really widely cited statistic that I think Elizabeth Warren, I think, was the originator of this, that uh, something like 50% uh, of all bankruptcies are the result of medical uh, uh, problems, issues. Um, so, uh, but I don't, I, I, I do know that um, that the poverty rate for those with a, a physical or mental disability is around 25%, whereas uh, those without a disability, the poverty rate is around eight or 9%. So there, there is a huge difference there. Um, great. Um, Thank you for that. And then, um, well, and, and, and Alex, what is this group Patriotic Millionaires? I've never heard of this before. Um, you know, I, I won't try and give uh, their, um, <laughs> their mission statement or anything. I'm not familiar enough, but um, yeah, it's Charlie Simmons from Patriotic Millionaires who asked the question. Charlie, if you want to tell us all about your organization in the chat, please feel free. Uh, and then we'll all have to go kind of Google after the event. Um, yeah. So um, I want to, so we have um, anyone who had a last question, we're, we're getting toward the end. Um, I want to encourage you to get that into the Q&A, um, but we have some great stuff to work with. And so I'm just thinking about how to kind of stack these questions together. Um, but I guess I want to start with kind of um, another provocative uh, question. And, and this one is from Liz Hipple at the Joint Economic Committee again. Um, and so she is asking, um, you know, Mark, you are, your finding is that like many people are falling in and out of poverty at some point over the life course. And one way to read that is to say like, this is terrible. It affects a lot of us. Another way to read that is to say, maybe it's actually not that big of a deal if everyone is experiencing it. So Liz asks like, is the, are these like poverty spells um, a temporary transitory state that people are able to get out of suggesting that actually you're economy is performing just fine at helping people pull people out of poverty. So this is exactly uh, often the question I get. And, and my response to it is, you know, it's how you, it, the, the statistic is the statistic. The data is the data. But how we interpret it can often be filtered through our sort of, you know, uh, ideologies. And so um, most poverty is um, fairly short term, a year or two, and folks get out of poverty. They may not get far out of poverty, but they get out of, and they might return to poverty. Uh, maybe 10 to 15% of all folks in poverty are there for long periods of time. So, you know, is this, is the economy working well? Well, you know, my, my view would be, 
we shouldn't have anybody falling into poverty. It's like, why should we have anybody experiencing a year or two of poverty, um, let alone a long spell of poverty? So, but I, 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 I often get that. And, and sort of my response is that, you know, it, yes, there is some, um, some art to sort of interpreting some of these statistics, but I would interpret the fact that, you know, 60% of Americans experience a year below the poverty line and three quarters, either poverty or near poverty is something that is not good for the country, and 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 even and with qualitative data, you also see that this is very disruptive for people. Um, this is very detrimental, even short-term poverty. So that would be my response to that. So speaking again to the important uh, importance of these mixed methods for more deeply understanding, like the problem. Yeah. So we have um, five minutes left, and so. Um, I want to kind of turn to kind of two questions. Um, you know, one is we've gotten um, questions in the chat about like specific programs, like a jobs guarantee, um, about kind of um, the fully refundable CTC as per periodic payments, like um, thinking about paid leave and fixes to unemployment insurance. So, kind of what what are you what policies are you excited about? Um, but then we have kind of um, people who want to return us back to the question of political will. So, I want to just read the, these two questions to you briefly. So, Javier Rodriguez at Claremont Graduate University says. As we are at a time at which we know many of the policies and programs that work to decrease poverty, um, you know, minimum wage, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and so those are coming up. As you mentioned, the problem is structural, political. It seems to be a more important question what to do. Uh, more, a more important question than what to do is how do we do it? Or to be more specific, how can we change politics? And then Barbara Weber at Results says Mark referenced the challenges related to the political will. Are you seeing anything in advocacy movements and or philanthropy that supports them in the philanthropy that supports them that leaves you especially hopeful about policy change to address poverty. So um, let's take a kind of a last word from both Mark and Alex um, on the things that uh, policies that excite you and then um, what these questions of political will. Well, Alex, you, you, you're, you, 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 you have a better handle on policies that excite us. So why don't you take that one? <laughs> I think, you know, because I know we don't have a ton of time left. I am particularly excited by the um, the interest in that sort of bridges the political divide uh, and the potential for what could be a child allowance, right? Like right now, it's we talk about it as a tax benefit, but there really is quite a bit of public will and uh, emerging political will to make this child tax benefit, or I'm sorry, yeah, the child tax credit benefit uh, permanent, those expansions to it permanent, the increasing the generosity of it, um, and increasingly more conversation about sort of decoupling that from work and from the tax system. And so, uh, you know, that sort of opens up the possibility when it comes to rethinking our cash transfer system writ large, you know, the opportunity for, uh, perhaps there is an opportunity for, and we sort of seen different political candidates explore this uh, on both the Democrat and, and Republican side, you know, what, what, uh, what energy there might be for a guaranteed income um, at the national level. So, so I think we are in this moment that leaves me very hopeful uh, where there is this curiosity, where there is emerging evidence at the local level, where we are very carefully watching the implementation of the child tax credit expansion and trying to be supportive to make sure that's successful, where we could see this momentum toward uh, a new way of, of, of doing our, you know, our cash transfers in this country. And then I'll turn it, Mark, you got 60 seconds for that. <laughs> <political. laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I will continue along the optimistic, uh, optimistic line. I, I, I think we're on the cusp of, of, kind of rethinking and, and really re-understanding and, and addressing these issues in a different way. And, and as Alex was pointing out, I think the, the whole idea of a child allowance is a pretty radical idea for the United States. And if we could get that into a permanent uh, program, that would be, that would be tremendous. So, um, uh, so yeah, but uh, it, it is the political will, I think that's the hard one. Uh, we know some of the solutions here. It's, it's being able to get those through, so anyway. 
Thanks for keeping it brief, Mark. I want to talk for a lot longer. Sandy, I see your question in the chat about preferred measures of poverty. I think in the follow-up to this, we'll share a conversation that Mark and I recorded um, that gets into some of that. So I hope you'll take a peek. Um, but now um, we are right up against the clock. So I want to just close us out with some really well-deserved thank yous. Um, a huge thank you to Mark and to Alex for your insightful and interesting and engaging comments. Um, I also want to offer thanks to Christian Ed Logan, Natalie and Tandi, and Shonda Williams for making this lecture a reality, and to all the other Equitable Growth staff who made the event run. And then also a big thank you to our colleague Liz Hipple, who laid the groundwork for this event. Um, thanks to everyone who submitted a question today. Uh, if we didn't have time to answer your question, we will do our best to follow up. Um, and finally, thank you to all of our attendees for joining us for this first lecture of 2021. I look forward to continuing this important conversation with all of you in the months ahead. So again, big thanks to everyone.